Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Appreciate the opportunity to come and be with you today and uh, see a lot of new faces, uh, which is good to know that there's change and growth taking place in the congregation. But uh, as Donnie said, I grew up here and there's a lot of familiar faces as well and glad to be able to be back and uh, recognize uh, people that I worship with for so long and people who taught me in Bible class and have the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, sorry that I put the elders and the congregation here in the conflict of having to come up with some different speakers for the rest of the week and hope the meeting continues to go well after today. But I am glad to be with you here this morning. I encourage you to take your Bibles out and follow along as we study God's Word together. If you want to, you can open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be starting from that text this morning. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish people who were Christians, but they were from a Jewish background. And as Christianity became difficulty, they were pulled back toward uh, that background that they came from. And so the Hebrew writer spends quite a, a bit of time talking about the fact that being Christians is superior to being Jewish uh, as far as religious uh, matters are concerned. He begins to show to them that Christ is greater uh, than the angels, Christ is greater than Moses, Christ is uh, greater than Aaron, uh, Christ uh, served in the heavenly tabernacle, not the earthly sanctuary. Christ's sacrifice is better than the sacrifice of the old uh, covenant. Uh, his covenant is better than the old covenant. And he spends a lot of time discussing those things, showing them that they have that which is better. And when we get to chapter 10, he then is going to begin to focus on applying that what they needed to take from uh, the things that he had discussed. And particularly in verse 19, he begins to talk to them about the fact that because they have this great blessing of being Christians, they need to draw near to Christ. They need to draw near to God as opposed to going back to Judaism. It says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so he wants them not to pull away from God, but to get closer to God, to be confident, to know the things that they have learned, and have that great relationship uh, with God. But as he mentions there in verse 25, there was a day approaching, and some people think about this as the day of judgment when Christ returns to the world. But there was a day facing them uh, that would happen before that day. And that was the destruction of Jerusalem. That was going to be a very difficult uh, time. And so they are about to experience that in just a few short years. And so their lives were probably gradually getting difficult as that day was approaching. And so he is seeing the effects that that difficulty has on their faith and their service to God, and the fact that some were drawing back to Judaism. If you drop down in chapter 10 to verse 32, it says, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, 
knowing that you had a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. And so when these people first became Christians, they were strong in the faith. And despite these sufferings that they were going through, they were willing to endure those sufferings. They were willing to experience the plundering of their goods and the difficulties that would come with that persecution. But they were also not ashamed to be associated with other people who were going through the same thing, including the writer of the book of Hebrews, who had uh, been experienced chains for his faith. And so they had exhibited a great faith when it came to serving God. They, at that point, were drawing near to Christ. And so he says, remember how you used to serve the Lord. And they needed to recall that as they continued uh, to go forward. So that brings us to verse 35 there. And the Hebrew writer says in verse 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And so having encouraged them to draw near to God, having talked about their past life, that you have done this in the past, now he's telling them at this point where you are, this is what you need to do to be like you were when you first obeyed the gospel and became Christians so that you might remain faithful to God and, and not draw back uh, to perdition. So that brings us to this expression, the just shall live by faith. And that's going to be uh, the topic of our lesson today is uh, this expression, the just shall live by faith. And I wanted to talk about this because I feel like as Christians today, we are kind of like those Hebrew Christians. Not the sense that we are being drawn or pulled back to Judaism, but as a Christian, we all come out of something. We all come out of the world. We may all come out of a different religion. We all come out of something. And then when we become Christians, we may be very zealous at first, but as things begin to get difficulty, like those Hebrew Christians, we may have the tendency to pull back and go back to where we have come from. And we shouldn't do that. We should have as much confidence drawing near to God, drawing near to Christ as the Hebrew writer tells them to come boldly to the throne. We need to have that boldness today. We need to have that confidence and not allow our confidence to be shaken by the things that we experience uh, in this world. We may not have experienced the suffering to the degree that they had experienced, but it is becoming more and more difficult for us as Christians uh, not to be vexed by the things that are taking place in our society. And so we need to know what it means the just shall live by faith because we want to be just today and we want to live by faith so that we might serve God acceptably. This expression, now the just shall live by faith, is found in different places in the scripture. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, we read, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk is talking about judgment that God is planning on bringing on the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans had once been an instrument from God to punish Judah uh, because of their sins and because they failed to repent. And so God used them to bring that nation down, and the Jews had gone into captivity in, in Babylon. But Babylon was arrogant. Uh, they were proud, and they did not think that God had caused them to have success. They felt like they had done that. And so now as God is going to bring them down. And so the proud is not upright, and God will bring judgment. But those Christians or those Jews that were in uh, captivity... They needed to continue to be faithful to God. And so he tells them the just shall live by his faith. We also see this expression in Romans 1 and verse 17. Paul in the previous verse has said that the 
he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And he says in verse 17, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so this expression is used in relationship to that powerful gospel. If we are going to be saved and if we're going to be righteous, then we have to be obedient to the gospel. And so the just will live by their faith in that saving message. And then Galatians 3 and verse 11, we see this expression, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident For the just shall live by faith. Here Paul is making the connection between the law and salvation uh, that the Jews couldn't seem to accept. They could not possibly keep the law. They could not live their life in accordance with it and, and be blessed. And so they needed to live their life in accordance with the gospel of Christ. And those who are just would do that. They would not go back to the law and uphold the law, but they would live their life in accordance with the gospel. And so we see this expression in different places, and we get an idea of how that expression is used. Uh, But we want to look at this expression as the Hebrew writer uses it. The Hebrew writer is actually quoting from Habakkuk when we look there at uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 10, where we find uh, this expression. In verse 38, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Well, Strong's tells us that that word just means innocent, holy, righteous. Those who are innocent from sin, those who are holy, living their lives holy, separated unto God, those who are righteous, they are the ones that live their life by faith. So what is faith? Well, the Hebrew writer is going to answer that question for us in this text. The first thing that we see in verse 1, as the Hebrew writer tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And depending on the translation you use, it may not use the word substance, it may use the word assurance. That faith is the assurance of things we hope for. And the Hebrew Christians hoped for things. They hoped for for blessings. They hope for the promises of this better covenant. And so faith is what gave them the assurance or made them sure of those things that they hope for. And that's what faith does for us today. Faith is going to give us that assurance of the things that we hope for as Christians. It's going to make us sure of those things. But he also tells us that faith is the evidence of things not seen. And again, depending on your translation, you may have a different word there for evidence. It may be conviction. That faith is the conviction of things that we haven't seen. And there are a lot of things in the spiritual realm that we haven't seen. We haven't seen God. We haven't seen Christ. Uh, We haven't seen heaven. But when we look at those things, we are certain of them. So that's Uh, our conviction that's our evidence faith is our assurance that those things we don't see exist but then he also tells us there in verse 3 that faith is what we get or is how we get understanding in verse 3 the Hebrew writer says by faith we understand that the words uh, worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible He takes something that we are all familiar with, and that's the creation of this world. How did this world come into existence? Well, there was a creator, and he had power, and he created this world. This world didn't happen as an explosion. Uh, This world didn't happen accidentally. A few years ago, a tornado in Missouri hit a Home Depot Well, that tornado didn't even make a birdhouse, didn't make a doghouse, let alone a whole house. Uh, That force didn't create order. It created chaos. And a lot of people want to say that this ordered world we live in happened because of chaos. It doesn't. This ordered world that we live in happens because God created the heavens and the earth. 
And so through faith, we have that knowledge. Faith gives us knowledge, not just of the creation, but faith gives us knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's greater than the angels, that he's, that he's greater than Moses, the lawgiver, and Aaron, the high priest. He's greater than the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Faith gives us the knowledge of all those things. And so the just are going to live by faith according to that knowledge they receive. And then also in chapter 10 here, we see that faith is something that we need in order to please God. In verse 6, the Hebrew writer says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So when the just live by faith, they're living by that which is necessary to please God. Without it, they can't please God. But with faith, the just can be pleasing to God. And we'll talk about that more uh, in just a few moments. But if we consider what we have looked at so far, we have talked about the just. And the just are the righteous. The just are the holy ones. And concerning these individuals, we see there in verse 2, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. The elders here is not speaking to elders in the church, but the older ones. The older ones uh, received a good testimony. And this testimony could mean that they had a good reputation among people. And we are going to talk about some of these individuals. Abel. Abel offered a well-pleasing sacrifice, and though he was dead, he still spoke. And so Abel had a good testimony, but this testimony, I believe, is talking about their relationship with God, that they had a good name with God because they lived their life according to faith. And if we live our life like them, then our good testimony, yes, we will have a good name with one another, but we're going to have a good name with God. And that's what we want. Whether people ever approve of us is unimportant. But if God approves of us, that's all that matters. That's the only thing that matters in our life is to know that we have a good testimony with God. And he repeats that in verse 39 there of chapter 11. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. And so he gives us more examples than Abel, but when he's talking about the just, he's talking about these individuals that have this good name with God, that they are righteous, that they are holy, uh, that they are innocent of sin, and because of that, God has given them a good name. And then we also talked about the aspect of faith, that these are the people that have assurance of things that are hoped for, they have the evidence of things that are not seen, the conviction of those things. Through faith, they have uh, understanding and they have knowledge and they know without that faith that they cannot please God. So that brings us to the idea of living. The just shall live by faith. How did these people live their lives when they lived their lives by faith? Well, I think verse 6 explains that. First of all, they wanted to come to God. They wanted to draw near to Him. They wanted to please God. They wanted a relationship with God. People today talk about having a relationship with God or a relationship with Jesus. These people had that. They wanted to come to God. And when they came to God, they believed that He is who He is. They believed that He is the creator of the world. They believed that they were made in God's image. They believed that they had a responsibility to Him to listen to Him and be obedient to Him. And because of this, they also, in verse 6, believed that He was a rewarder. That those who listened to Him and followed His will, that He rewarded them when they diligently sought Him. And some of the examples that we see here in Hebrews chapter 11, they were very diligent in, in seeking God. They were very diligent in the things that they did. And this is what the Hebrew Christians needed to do. Instead of suffering and, and getting weak in the faith and drawing back, drawing away from God, they needed to be diligent. 
They needed to be all in and serving God so that they could be rewarded, but also so that they could have that good name with him. And so let's look at some of these examples that the Hebrew Christian or Hebrew writer talks about uh, concerning those who are just, that live by their faith, and let's uh, see how they did that. The first example that he talks about is Abel in verse 4. By faith, all Abel offered a, uh, to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. So Abel, we're told, Abel is just. What did he do? By faith, Abel served God. He believed that God is, and he believed that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek, sought him. And particularly, we look at Abel, the Hebrew writer says that he offered a more excellent sacrifice to God than his brother Cain did. So how did he live? Well, by faith, he lived his life by worshiping God the way that God wanted him to, to worship him, by offering an acceptable sacrifice, and as a result of this, he was rewarded. I think it's important when we look at being rewarded by God that that doesn't mean that God is going to spare our lives, that God is going to give us a big bank account and a nice home and everything that we want materially. If you serve God diligently and seek him, you might suffer. Things might be, get difficult. And in Abel's case, his brother hated him so much that his own brother killed him for how he worshiped God. God let Abel be killed. But that doesn't mean Abel wasn't forgotten. God rewarded Abel because Abel has a good name with God. He has a good testimony with God. And as we see, Abel, though he is dead, he's still speaking. And verse 39 tells us that he's still waiting for that promise that God is going to bring ultimately to those who live their life by faith. And so when we look at Abel, we need to be like Abel. We need to have the assurance, the certainty, the knowledge of how God wants us to worship him and, and worship him that way. But let's look at the next example there of Enoch in verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So we think about Enoch. Enoch lived his life by faith. The just shall live by faith. Enoch, we are told, pleased God. In his life, Enoch made it a point in the way he conducted himself and how he walked to please God. Every day, Enoch did that. That was the choice he made, the decision he made. I'm going to walk with God today. And he did it so well, God decided, you know what? I'm not going to let this man take, taste death. I'm going to take him from this earth. He's not going to experience death, and I'm going to bless him that way. And then God tells us about it so that we know about that man named Enoch. But Enoch was the just who lived by faith. Enoch knew God, knew God was a rewarder. He diligently sought God in accordance with his will, and God rewarded him for that. That's the type of faith that the Hebrew Christians needed. That's the type of faith that we need today ourselves. In verse 7, we see Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. And so... Uh, like Enoch and like Abel, Noah was the just that lived by faith. What made Noah just? Well, despite the wicked, wicked world that he lived in, where the thought and the intent of everyone's heart was evil continually. That sounds like our world, but apparently our world hasn't got to that point. But Noah's world did. It got to that point and God said, I've had enough. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy the world. But because Noah had found grace in the eyes of God, because he lived by faith, 
he was just. God said, I can't not warn Noah, and I can't give Noah deliverance. And so God went to Noah and said, I'm going to bring a flood, and if you build an ark this size and this shape, and you put these animals in that ark, I'll I'll deliver you from this flood. And so that's what Noah did. By faith, he believed that God is. He believed that God is a rewarder. And so he spent many years building this ark to prepare for a flood that the world had never known of before. And so he exhibited his diligence in serving God. He received a good testimony from that. We, we talk well of Noah today, but his testimony was with God in heaven. God knew the type of person Noah was, and God spared Noah from this flood, and so he was rewarded uh, for what he did. And then we will look at one more example here in Hebrews, and that's Abraham. Beginning there at verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. When we think about Abraham being a a foreigner in this country uh, and dwelling in tents, uh, it's commendable of Abraham that God says, this is yours. This is the land I'm going to give you. And he never built a house there. He never established a farm. How many of us would serve God that way? How many of us would go around living in tents and not owning a house and not owning land and property? Would we be that committed to God? Abraham was. And Abraham left his home where he had all those things and he went somewhere he had never seen before. He was just because he lived his life by faith. He believed that God is. He believed that God is a rewarder of those who diligently sought him. And so Abraham had no problem when God said, leave your home and go to a land that I'm going to give you. Abraham got up, he went, and he left. I'm not saying that Abraham's perfect. There were problems in Abraham's life. You go back and you see the problems that he had between him and his wife and his handmaid and Hagar. You see the problems that Abraham had when he was afraid of his relationship with his wife and he lied about their relationship in order to preserve his own life. Abraham had weaknesses. But in general, Abraham was a person who was just because he lived by faith. And so as we look at Abraham, he left and he went. It says in verse 10, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Well, I'm going to tell you that city is not in the land of Canaan. Abraham wasn't waiting for a city in Canaan. He was looking beyond Canaan. He was looking to something more, something bigger. He was looking to heaven. He wanted to go to heaven. And so in order to get to heaven, he was willing to leave his home. He was willing to go to the land of Canaan and dwell in tents as God had commanded him to do. Abraham was serving God by faith. It says in verse 11, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. We know when we go back and read the Bible, Abraham is first introduced to us as Abram. His name was changed to Abraham because that word meant father of a many, father of a multitude. Would you let people call you that name if you're 100 years old and you haven't had the child of promise yet? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have a multitude of children. Uh, you're 100. But Abraham accepted that name. He had faith in God. And so when we look at Abraham, he believed that he would be rewarded for serving God. He looked for that city uh, in verse 10. And uh, we see that he wanted 
uh, to, to have that relationship with God and spend an eternity uh, one day with him in heaven. And so I think the Hebrew writer is bringing the, these examples to these Hebrew Christians to show them. You're, I know you're going through difficult times. I know things are getting harder for you as Christians. But you need to serve God as these people who live by faith serve God. You will be righteous and you will be holy and you will be approved by God and have a good testimony with him if you seek him. No, believe that he is. Believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and he will reward you for that. They were rewarded in their life and they had the hope of that reward uh, to come. And that's something that I believe, again, we all need to hear today. These Hebrew Christians, the Hebrew writer has been telling them the, the old law, the old covenant is gone. Now physically, they could go to Jerusalem, they could look at the temple, they could see the high priest, they could see the animal sacrifices still being made. Physically, it was there. But do you realize in just a few short years that would be wiped out? That would be gone? They wouldn't physically see it anymore. What they physically saw would literally show them what the Hebrew writer is talking about here. And so they shouldn't have confidence in that ode. They should remember what the Lord said. These things are going to be destroyed. And when these things start to happen, you need to flee. You need to run. And if they listened to the Lord, they would be delivered and then they would uh, have the hope of eternal life. As Christians, that's something that you and I need to believe as well. That we need to serve God. And we need to be faithful to Him. I hear a lot of people talking about, well, I want to go to heaven. When I die, I, I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God. Uh, seeing this world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim and a stranger here. I'm looking forward to the day that I'll go to heaven. But people who are saying that are not like Abel. Abel looked for a city that God made, and when God told him to sacrifice a certain way, Abel did it. There are people today who talk about going to heaven, but when God tells them how he wants to be worshipped, they ignore him. And they think, well, I'm just, and I'm spiritual because I want to go to heaven, but you're not doing what God said. Enoch, when you look at Enoch, he wanted to be a part of that city that God was making for those who were just, for those who obtained a good testimony with him. So what did Enoch do? Every day, Enoch lived his life to walk with God, to please him. And there are a lot of people today that talk about, oh, I want to go to heaven. Uh, yeah, that's my goal. I want eternal life with God. I want to spend uh, eternity with Him when I depart from this world. But when it comes to walking each day to please God, they will not do that. They will not remove the foul language from their life. They will not remove the hatred that they have toward other people. They will not remove the immorality from their life that's seen in participating in things like sexual immorality and dressing in modestly and being involved in things like going to the prom and going to dances. Oh, I want to go to heaven, but I also want to go to the prom. That's not how the faith live. The just do not live their life that way. When they live their life, they believe that God is a rewarder. If he tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. Like Noah did it. Like Abraham did it. That's what the Hebrew writer wanted for these Hebrew Christians, and that's what we need to learn from this today as well. If we are going to be rewarded by God and ultimately have that uh, eternal life with him, then we need to live our life by faith as well. As we continue on in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning there at verse 13, the Hebrew writer says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These all died in the faith. They died before they received the promise. 
How many of us are willing to be faithful unto death? If we started being persecuted or people started coming into our homes and plundering our goods, would we say, oh, God has forsaken us? Well, I I shouldn't experience these things because I was doing what God says and that shouldn't happen to me. All those people died in faith. None of them are still living. That doesn't mean that God has forgotten them or abandoned them. They still have the hope of eternal life with God. They haven't received the promises yet, but they're going to receive them. But in their lives, they were assured of those promises. They had the faith that what God said, the things that they should hope for were going to happen. And they embraced them. Abel said, you know what? I know my brother is getting angry with me, but God told me to worship this way, and this is the way I'm going to offer my sacrifice. And he was just going to let his brother continue to get more angry and more angry. But Abel was going to do what's right. Noah knew, hey, nobody's ever witnessed a worldwide flood, and I can tell people about it, and they think I'm crazy, but I'm going to build this ark. I'm going to build it just like God told me to. I'm going to build it out of gopher wood, and I'm going to get these animals, and I'm going to put them on this ark because I believe God is going to bring this flood. When we look at Noah, he embraced what God said. And we see that these people confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were not making this world their home. They were living to make their home with God in eternity. Is that how you're living your life as a Christian? This world is not your home. You're just here temporarily. You're making your home with God eternally. And so whatever God tells you to do and whatever comes as a result of him telling you to do that, you're going to live your life by faith. In verse 14 we read, For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. The Hebrew writer is telling these Christians, look, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and the rest that we read about in chapter 11, every one of those people had an opportunity to return, to go back to where they were before they started living by faith. They all experienced those difficulties. These Hebrew Christians were experiencing that opportunity to return. And we all will experience the opportunity to return. But the just do not live that way. They do not live by drawing back. They do not live by returning to where they came from. The just will persevere and continue to diligently seek God. Why did those individuals not take advantage of the opportunity to return? Well, verse 16 tells us, But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared uh, prepared a city for them. The reason they didn't return is because they desired something better than this world. Better than the things of this world, they desired a, a heavenly country. That's what they were living their life for. That's why they were obedient to the commandments of God. That's why these Hebrew Christians... They needed to be confident and draw uh, closer to God, be bold in coming before the throne of grace instead of drawing back into Judaism because there's something better. There's a heavenly country. And that's the reason that we need to be faithful to God uh, today as well is because we desire that which is better. And if you truly desire that which is better, the commandments of God are not burdensome. They're not difficult, and they're not hard. When God asks us to do something, we will diligently do that because we know this is how I receive a good testimony with God. This is how I'm going to make a good name with God. And as it says there at the end of verse 16, God will say of us, as he said of these people, I am not ashamed to be their God. We all want to live our life that way. 
that God is not ashamed to be our God, that God wants us to have a relationship with him, that God looks forward to the day that we are with him in heaven. That's how we want to live our life when it comes to serving him. So as we think about this chapter and we begin to bring this lesson to a close, how would the Hebrew Christians be just living by faith? What would the Hebrew writer tell them, this is what you need to do in order to be the just living by faith? Well, we'll go back to Hebrews 10 there in verse 35 through 39. He says in verse 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't cast away your confidence. They had been taught the gospel. They had heard the great message of salvation. And they had believed that. They had become Christians. They had zealously served God. That was their confidence. Don't cast that away. Don't go back to Judaism. For us... We have heard the gospel. We have become Christians. Don't return back to the world. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't think, oh, things are difficult and it would be easier if we go. No, it won't. It won't be easier. We lose everything if we cast away our confidence. In verse 36, he told them, you have need of endurance. In order for them to live by faith and receive a good testimony with God, they needed endurance. They needed to realize things may be challenging, things may be difficult and hard, but you can endure them. And so that's why we have these examples for us in Hebrews chapter 11. And he is going to make point of that in chapter 12. We're not going to get into that. But those are the great cloud of witnesses that surround us. And they show us that just can live by faith. They can do it. We did it, and you can do it in your life as well. We just have need of endurance. And then in verse 39, he says, But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. That should motivate us. If we are a Christian, and we have left the world, and we have become a child of God, it should motivate us to know that if we stop, if we draw back, it's to perdition. That's destruction. It's going to destroy us. We will not have a good name with God. He's not going to look forward to the day. Oh, I look forward to the day that they can be with me in heaven. I remember when they became a Christian and fell away, but bless their heart, I'm, I'm still going to take them up here. It's not going to work that way. We have to live by faith. And if we don't, we draw back to the destroying of our soul. <coughs> And then he tells them in verse 39, those who believe, believe to the saving of the soul. If we are going to live by faith, then we have to believe to that point that we might be saved. And then as we end their study in Hebrews 11, there, verses 39 and 40, the Hebrew writer says, all, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. All those people we read about in chapter 11 are waiting for the same promise that we're waiting for. And that's to have a home with God in eternity. And I hope that this will be your desire and this lesson will encourage you to live your life by faith so that you can have that reward one day.